Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind him. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Finley to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Connor Burr. Good gosh, dirty! This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome into this edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast. It is the final recap edition of the podcast for the 2019 regular season and the uh, tar, uh, season at all as the uh, Tar Heels wrap it up with a dominant bowl victory over the Temple Owls. And so. Uh, we are here to recap the game against Temple. We're not going to really recap the season uh, just yet. We'll have future podcasts that'll do that. But uh, to do that, I welcome in my co-host, Josh Marlowe. For the final time, uh, we are recapping a game. And uh, this season was a lot different in terms of recaps than a year ago. And uh, came to an exciting finish here on uh, Friday afternoon. I wish we would have played more games like this all year long because, I mean, this is going to be a fun recap because this was a really fun game to watch. It was kind of odd. I I preached on here really after the NC State game that winning a bowl game doesn't matter. Uh, It's more about, you know, the the, the practice time is more valuable. But for some reason, man, I don't know because it's been three years since we got to see Carolina in a bowl game. I got into it early when the game was relatively close. And um, was really, really impressed with how the team played. Mac Brown made a statement earlier in the week that he has prepared no different than when he played or in title games at Texas. Carolina definitely looked more prepared today than Temple. Um, they were clearly more invested in wanting to win the game than Temple, and it led to, in my opinion, their most complete performance of 2019. Yeah, no, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, I know a lot of people will probably want to look back at the game against NC State, but, you know, I think the final score is a little misleading to how well the Tar Heels played throughout the entirety of that game because, remember, they were trailing at halftime in that game. This game was totally different. Up 14 at halftime, something we hadn't seen really all year. Uh, And this uh, this was a team that looked, like you said, ready to go, looked more motivated, which actually kind of shocked me. I thought Temple would come out motivated to show that, you know, they they were battle-tested because I feel like a lot of people, especially the betters in Vegas, were on Carolina. They thought that the Tar Heels were the better team in this one because they came from a power conference, and that really just showed here. I don't know, uh, and there was some, some idiot who put out a tweet after the game that's been circulating around social media saying that uh, this was a brutal loss for Temple. Uh, they have the better football program. Uh, can, can you can you remember that uh, literally they were the stain in the shorts of the uh, college uh, of the college football world up until Al Golding got there? Like that just made me laugh. The guy also um, said this was our quote Super Bowl. Um, uh, yeah, that's if, not that's not true. When um, the day comes that Temple is Carolina Super Bowl, will be the day I quit watching Tar Heel football. Temple, the Military Bowl. That I mean, no, yeah, no, no. I mean, no. you just this put those was, in the same category as NC State, right? I mean, other teams. Here's no. the here's here's the difference. Okay, 
like you said, you have a Hall of Fame coach that is getting you prepared for this game. It's no slight to Rod Carey. I think Rod Carey is a really good football coach. I mean, look, they won eight games this year. They beat a Memphis team that's going to the Cotton Bowl. This team doesn't suck, but, I mean, let's be really honest here. This should be more about the fact that Mac Brown is that good of a coach that he can get you motivated for this game, not the fact that, oh, well, they decide, they, they just decided to show up today because uh, this is the biggest bowl game that they've ever played in, the military bowl as a 6-6 six and six football team. Like, does this dude, like, do any research at all? Me, I don't need to do research about Temple because I've been following college football for a while, and I know that out, you know, before Al Golden got there, they were complete and utter crap. Like, let's just be real. They were horrible. So, uh, I, you know, there that, that was one that I just I didn't get. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's very encouraging for, for, for Tar Heel fans. Um, I, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's weird. I'm not going to say that I didn't want to win the game. And, you know, when you talk about, oh, you were preaching how bowl games really don't matter. Okay, here's the thing. I still think that if you look at this game and think, Okay, well, Carolina won 55-13 to in the Military Bowl. This means that they should be competing next year for a potential college football playoff spot. If you're basing that off of this game, uh, yeah, you, you, you probably, I mean, you're just going a little too far. Like, yeah. that shouldn't be how you look at this game. I think, you know, if they would have lost the game, we would be a little disappointed, but what your point is, is we would not be sitting here like, oh man, wow, this is this program's not going in the right direction anymore. They're trending downward because they lost a bowl game. That, I mean, that's kind of where it's at. Unless it's like we've talked about, a New Year's Six Bowl, maybe there's a couple other bowl games, some higher end bowl games that kind of matter. Outside of those ones, I don't think, I mean, let's be real honest, nobody's sitting there saying, okay, if you lose the Texas Bowl, okay, you're you're in trouble. You know, th- this program's in in deep deep ish, you know, deep trouble. So, I mean, come on. Yeah, no, today really what it looked like was Carolina looked like a team that seized the moment and understood that you use today to build toward next year. Mhm. And next year comes with expectations. That's part of bringing in a Hall of Fame head head, head coach that Changed a lot in his first year on campus. As a guy that upped the up the recruiting in the state and nationally, you brought in a top twenty class, um, upgraded the facilities uh, both in the locker room and on the playing field. He did all the grit stuff off the field. The question was, what was he going to do on the field? And on the field, he won seven games. He beat Duke. He beat NC State. Something that cost Larry Fedora his job. You win a bowl game. Now you're seven and six. Yeah, the schedule looks tough to start next year. But also, if you find a way to win both those games, you're going to be talked about as a as a dark horse to to make the to to bust the college football playoff. You're going to be Mark. My, they will be picked to win the ACC Coastal next year because uh, of the I, sheer amount of yeah. offensive talent that's coming back. Uh, just general talent. Uh, they lose four starters that started the game today. I I say that because Nick Polino did start the year at offensive guard. Actually, started at center. Uh, and then eventually went down with the injury, and Brian Anderson took over. He doesn't start anymore. Today, they started Izudu and, and McKeithen again. So, uh, yeah, they're scheduled to lose four starters total from the offensive and defensive units and just one on the offensive side of the ball. That one is a big one, Charlie Heck. That's going to be tough to replace. But still, uh, yeah, this I, I wrote about it in the recap article about the things that we learned this offense next year, game one, they should be in the about the same place as they were yeah. at the end of the season. This should be a unit next year that can legitimately make an argument that they are the best in the in the ACC, uh, if not the country. Yeah, they I will mean, challenge to be one. This of the was best. an offense today that entered the game. They they finished the regular season 14th in the country in total yards in terms. Well, of Well, that's offense. going up. That's going and, up and, probably and, again because they um, finished with 534 yards of total offense today. So that'll probably go up that number. And too. I mean, today they threw for 296. You ran for 238. You right. had 33 first downs. The third down offense today, 11 of 14. That's video game s numbers. Um, yeah, so they ran 75 plays, averaged 7.1 yards per play. 
in their red zone, which has been their biggest weakness. They converted on all seven trips. Um, they were 7-of-7 seven seven inside the 20-yard line. They looked like they finally were comfortable with what they were doing. Right. Phil Longo's play calling was the best it's been probably all year long in terms of in terms of his situational play calling. Right. Yeah. And, I mean, and, the, and yeah. the feel for the game. Sam Howell was Sam Howell. He made plays with his legs, made some ridiculous throws, and you had your talented wide receivers and Deami Brown and Daz Newsom make acrobatic catches in the end zones, and it just it all finally came together as we spring forward for next year. When Mac Brown talked about the office, what he envisioned, what you saw today is what he envisioned when he brought in Phil Longo, when Sam Howell flipped his recruitment from Florida State to Carolina, was an offense that can put up 50 against one of the defensive or one of the country's better units. Um, Temple's pass rush was all we heard about coming into this game. Could Carolina pass protect? Uh, that was that was pretty much what they did best today. And, they did not early in the game. They were not run blocking, and there were many all. times that Sam Howell had to run for his run run for his life. And when he did, more often than not, it was his fault because he didn't get rid of the ball on an initial read, right? Which is still so, something that he's going to be um, working through in the off season. You know, but you know, it was just it was a very good to see defensively. This was minus the the miss tackling on the long touchdown play on the screen right. pass. Kind of what you thought you'd want to see from Jay Bateman. Well, let's focus on the offense just really quickly. No, let's, I, wanna I want to talk about the defense. Okay, well, uh, this is my damn podcast, so there we go. I'm fired. Uh, I mean, yeah, we'll just yeah, we we do have a backup co-host that we can bring in. I mean, it's it's pretty easy to just uh, go to our Vincent Amendola, call him off the bench. That's fine. Uh, who would have won the game today uh, if he would have gotten he, the start? He, he actually may yeah, have. He may, his, he may have had as bad as Temple played. Oh, I today. think he would have won the game, but we're not going to get into that argument again. But when you look on the offensive side of the ball, how about this? Two hundred ninety-six passing yards from this offense. That's the lowest number since the Duke game, and still, this offense puts up. 55 points. That's the best thing to me because in past years, and again, it might have been because, you know, Fedora was never really willing to lean on his rushing game. You they were your running game wasn't winning you football games. Very rare. You had some games in 2015 because you had the Elijah Hood and Marquise Williams combination. But really since then, they were not I mean there was never a game where you were saying, "Okay, we're going to put it in our running game's hands and let them win the football game." But I mean they did it again today. I mean, look, Javante Williams, he ends up coming up short of the 1000-yard mark by 67 yards. He still had an amazing season, and let's be real honest, if he doesn't get banged up against Virginia, he probably reaches that 1,000-yard mark. Uh, And then Michael Carter reaches the 1,000-yard mark. Uh, Both guys today, uh, Javante Williams, uh, 85 yards on 14 carries, 6.1 average, which is just kind of what we've come to expect from him. 84 yards for Michael Carter on 18 carries. Just, uh, you know, these two guys just seeming to wear down the defense, and then There's an interesting thing that I think is going to be worth watching early on next year, and that's Sam Howell's running ability. And look, anybody that says that that uh, they're saying, "Oh, well, we're kind of shocked that he was really that good on the ground." Did you did you watch him in high school? Like this guy ran for over three thousand yards in high school and scored sixty touchdowns. Like he has a running background, especially in the red zone. I'm interested to see because, yeah, they finished the season pretty well in the red zone, but you could still tell there were a couple of times early in the game today where you were kind of scratching your head saying, why are we doing this in the red zone? Why are we throwing a screenplay on second and eight when we're you know at the 12-yard line? It's stuff like that that still kind of has you scratching your head. I wonder if next year, with Jace Reuter back, with Jacoby Criswell also being there, if for some reason – you had an injury to Sam Howell, will they be willing to run him a little more in the red zone? Because if they are, that opens up a whole new type of package that you can run down there because then you can empty out the backfield and run some quarterback draws with them. You can use some read option with them down there as well. I think that could really help this team in the red zone come next season. Yeah, that's, that's going to be a part of the offense because what was the first thing Mac Brown said when he talked about his offense going into halftime? Well, our quarterback made some plays with his legs. Right. So that's something that he wants a part of the offense. It's a staple of all of these spread offense that you're going to see right. in the cost of ball playoff. Look, we're not going to see Kyler Murray or Cam Newton type runs from Sam Howell. He's not going to be carrying the ball 16, 
18 times a game. That's not going to happen. But you'll have those strategic moments where they put it in and it can pick up a big first down. Or if you're in the red zone, you can score a touchdown or two with them. Well, because, I mean, you you add the element to just a basic quarterback draw on, you know, second and yeah. eight, third and six. Something that you didn't really account for that this year, but now that's a part of your offense. That's a new wrinkle. It's going to open up things in the red zone because you can run some speed option, some read option, some some other stuff with his legs. And and I, I think that's just something that – and look, today, when he took off and ran, they were smart runs. It was when the play broke mm-hmm. down, there was a lane. The one time you might have asked that, hey, you probably want him to get down, but I kind of got fired up seeing my quarterback lower his shoulder. Well, I'm going to tell you. Uh, uh, lay a hit because what it does is right. that it shows the other guys that he's wanting to put his body on the line for It's going to take him a long time to learn how to slide because he never slid in high school. Because he knew in high school he played in a conference where you had maybe a, one or two other guys that were going to even FBS programs, not even Power 5 programs. So you didn't have to slide because you could run through players. Or like he did last year as a senior, you could jump over a player. Um, you know, I don't know if we're going to see that at this level. You don't really want to see that. But it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be tough to get him to slide. He's a hard-nosed runner like that. Um, but I think you're, you're right. And the quarterback draw is really interesting because you got to think next year, just from people seeing him so far this year and, and how he was able to pick apart defenses, you're going to have times where they'll drop eight into coverage, not even thinking about his running ability. You start running some quarterback draws, all of a sudden, I mean, teams are going to be like, how in the hell are we slowing this team down? How, how are we going to stop this off? I mean, the thing is, is that, like, I don't want to come across as Homer or whatever. When this offense is humming, there, there, there's no stopping that. When Phil Longo's feeling confident, you know, behind the headset. Right. And you've got a quarterback like Sam Howell that's got all the tools, can make every throw you want him to make. And if you can create lanes in the running in the running game for Carter and Javante, you're not going to stop the offense. Is that really being a homer, though, or is that really just stating facts? And because I mean, let's you... be honest, that's kind of just what we've seen on on film. When this offense can can start running the ball and, and it opens up the passing game, you you there's just no not you can't really stop them. There's not much you can do. Yeah, it's not being a homer. That's just watching what we're seeing. Um, I mean, at this point. Remember when we said, we kind of laughed before the season when Mac Brown said, you know, we want to look like Oklahoma's offense. And we were like, you know, Mac, let's, uh, let's kind of re- reel it in. You're a liar, but sure. Uh, I, at, at this point now, uh, that seems pretty legit. I think it wasn't the fact that we were laughing that the passing game could get there. We were kind of saying, okay, come on, man. Like the running game, we've had, we have guys with a ton of upside, but... We, you know, are they really going to be able to play the way that Oklahoma's running backs play consistently? Uh, yeah, they they've done they did that this year. Uh, they showed that. Look, it's not the fact that the running backs just weren't living up to expectations. It was more of the fact that Larry Fedora and his staff really just weren't using the running backs the way that they probably should have been. Yeah, no, and look, Larry, you know, look, we all know this guy wasn't the brightest guy. Uh, we were one time oh, first Jesus. and goal from the one and behind was, the chain. That was rough. But he, all, okay. he, would he always wasn't talk the smartest comp- play caller. Well, Let's say that. He's not okay. the smartest guy either. He'd always talk about, well, balance isn't about, you know, your runs and pass uh, ratio. It's about your yards in, in your pass game and your run game. Well, when your run-pass ratio is 300 yards to 100 yards, that's not balance. And I think that's something right. Mac Brown has said was like we want to be two fifty in the air and two fifty in the ground. Today you are two ninety four through the air and two thirty eight on the ground. That's pretty damn good. And yeah, I'll take that any day of the week. You know that's that's Oklahoma esque. That's what Ohio State's doing esque. LSU, Clemson. Guess what? All four of those teams. What are they doing? They're competing for a national championship. Right. The offense can get you to the playoff. Do you got to be good defensively to win a championship? Yes, i.e. Oklahoma. Right. They've got to get up on the defensive end. Well, they've but, been but, better this year, and that's the reason why they're in the playoff but the as opposed to the thing is, is that Mac Brown there. realizes that. If we, right. if we can put up 50 on anybody and you win the games that you're supposed to win, right. then you can go compete for a national championship. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much how I look at it. I want my offense to be a unit that's capable of winning me 
nine to eight to nine games a year. And then my defense can can win me some games along the way because that's just the nature of college football now. The NFL, it's a little bit different. Your defense can probably win you eight games and your offense wins you the other eight. But, I mean, if you're if we're being honest, at the college level right now, you've got to be able to score or else you're, not, you're just not going to be able to keep up with people. Look at Michigan State, a team that we saw play earlier today. Now, they won their bowl game. That was a team in the preseason. Some people thought, okay, they could challenge in the East. And... No, that just that didn't happen. Why? Because their offense can't move the football. You have got to be able to move the football or else you're not going to have a chance because in this day and age, having a good defense, I mean, look, 28.6 a game or 23.6 a game, excuse me, is what this defense finished with this year, their best mark since 2010. If you go back and look in the 90s, 23.6 a game is like middle of the road in the country some people are saying, oh, man, they're struggling defensively. Now, that's a great year defensively. So that's kind of how it's changed. And, I mean, look, you said that a defense is necessary to be able to challenge and, and potentially get into the college football playoff. I'm not going to say that the defense is there yet. They still have work to do, especially when it comes to the depth that's there. But this unit, the progression that we've seen from this unit for just from last year to this year, is phenomenal. And I wrote in my article after the game when I recapped it, at this point, there is no way that Jay Bateman is not going to receive some sort of bonus or raise this offseason, right? Because what this man has done with this defense in as little of time as he has and with the fact that he was fighting through uh, injuries at midseason in the secondary that were just unbelievable. I mean, literally every week you had one or two guys in the secondary that were starting that were going down with injuries. The fact that this team is where they are right now is just phenomenal. He has done such a great job, and it can't be understated. Yeah, there's a reason why he was tabbed early when Mac Brown was hired as this is the guy. He was the right. first, pretty much the first name you heard was, well, Army defensive coordinator Jay Bateman is the top of his wish list. This guy knows how to game plan. He knows how to coach. Um, we've seen adjustments made at, at, during the game at halftime that we just quite frankly haven't seen in our fandom of Carolina football. And today I think you got to see the vision for what he wants this defense to look like. You had guys just all over the field making plays. I thought the thing that you saw today, these guys were confident and what they were doing in their assignments. And it's not right. just – it wasn't just Aaron Crawford and Jason Strobridge. Storm Duck, Don Chapman, young guys that just felt confident about what they were doing and where they were on the field, and they were thriving. Well, and, it's really been the last three games. I mean, yeah. Mercer, you were kind of saying, okay, well, you would expect that. But really, against State and then today against Temple, this is a unit that feels like – because it, you saw the mindset became – as the Fedora era continued, that pretty much you were just there, and if you could come up with an occasional stop, you were doing something right. You didn't really have confidence. You pretty much knew as a defensive player going in, we're probably going to let up 28 or 35. We just got to hope our offense can find a way to bail us out. That became the mindset. Under Jay Bateman, that is nowhere near the mindset right now. It's, it's a totally different mindset, and yeah, you're right. This is the most confident that I've seen this unit since Butch Davis. I, I mean, I just have to come out and say it. Yeah, like, oh, no, that's that's fact. I mean, it was just – it was evident. Um, you saw this defense in situations this year where, man, like, how are they going to handle Clemson's – all that talent? And – they slowed that Clemson offense down. It's the best anybody's played against yeah. Clemson. I mean, now, until hopefully Ohio State tomorrow right. night. You know, you know. Now look, did they look rough in games against Virginia and Pitt? Yeah, they did. But okay, Virginia played in the ACC championship. They're going to play in the Orange Bowl. Right, Pitt. You were beat to hell. Oh, I yeah. Mean, that, that was the other problem. You got to look at where your team was at that time. You have tired guys on your defensive front, combining with a secondary that is running guys that honestly probably didn't expect to see any sort of major time. Most of them probably didn't even expect to see a rotational role this year. And they're out there, basically told them, hey guys, go give it a shot. See what you got. We, we got no choice. You got to be out there. And 
uh, you know, it, it, it's going to end up helping in the future that these guys got that experience. But yeah, at the time we're sitting there like, oh my gosh, this yeah, is horrible. No, they're I mean, they're just they got to find a way to scrap. You know, so, and you're going into an off season where you're bringing in you're, you're you're loading up the secondary with transfer talent coming in from Clemson and Virginia Tech. Right, Patrice Renee is coming back for his fifth year after tearing his ACL earlier in the year. I mean, you just you have to feel good about where both sides of the ball are at as you enter the off season, and that's what that's what you wanted, right? Was when you got the bowl game was man, you get ten to fifteen more practices. If you win, I mean, it, it only adds the momentum that you're building. But now, you know, when you when you wake up at those four a.m. workouts in January and it's cold as crap, I mean, you're going to feel a little bit more motivated because you know, hey, we can be really good. Yeah, we got a potential Heisman candidate at on the roster yeah. at quarterback. We've got a defense that is improving and that it just, you know, is looking like a unit that, you know, could be one of the better, you know, defenses in the ACC, at least in the top half of defenses in the ACC, somewhere that you would not have imagined you would have been before last year. You would have thought, okay, we'll take some steps forward. We're not, nobody expected this Tar Heel team in the final three games of the season to allow seven. 10 and 13 points respectively. Nobody saw that. So, uh yeah, I mean it's th- there is a lot of confidence on this team right now. Just talking a little more about the specifics of the game. I'll ask you this one. This will be interesting. Better game, you think Don Chapman or Storm Duck cuz both guys looked really good. Those are two young guys that I think next year, even with the guys that are coming in, they will play roles next year. Uh, I got to go with Storm Duck. I mean, first off, he got put on this list with the greatest Ducks name in the history of Ducks. That was uh, the lamest list I have ever seen know, and, in and my and entire five, five life. Five of them come from Disney characters. So, I mean, the fact that the, uh, I guess, what's the word, the, the legitimacy of the list kind of has to be in question. Guy got in the end zone. Probably the reason why I put him right. in there because he got the pick six. And also, well, his name's pretty elite, too. But, yeah, both guys, guys that I've been impressed with this year. Um, at, at at certain times, really have us feeling a lot more um, positive about that back unit, even if they're on the two, even if even if they're rotational players next yeah. year. Yeah, well, especially Storm because yeah. Corner is just oh, there are so many different guys that they're going to so, be able to roll out. There. Um, yeah, I mean, just but both guys and like Chapman. This is a guy that I'd said after Georgia Tech that guy'd be my starter. I. I don't, you know, just, I said this on live, social media. Live with the growing pains. Right, I said this on social media. I, I understood that there were a couple times where he was out of position, and, and I think there were a couple times today where he might have been out of position on, you know, some of the deeper passes and stuff like that. But it's rare. It's like once or twice, and that's going to happen f- with your guys to begin with. It happened at times during the season. It happened again today with, with one of your veteran guys and Miles Dorn, just a communication issue. Uh, I mean, we don't know if it was him or Chapman that was out of position, but you you look at him today, 10 total tackles, led the team, uh, one and a half tackle for loss, had a sack as well. I mean, he was all over the field. He was doing everything that you needed him to do, and really since he had to come in and start that game, now he, I mean, he started the game against Mercer, but he came in, remember, in the middle of that game against Pittsburgh and took over, and since that moment, he has looked about as good as you could have hoped for a true freshman. He, I mean, there there were very few times where you were pointing out and saying, man, Don Chapman's in trouble out there. You got to get him out of the game. I, I, I'm i with you. I don't really understand what happened to him in that midseason stretch. Maybe there's an injury that we didn't know about or, or whatnot, but this is a guy that right now, with Miles Dorn leaving, you're going to have Miles Wolfolk back, but is this not a guy that, has made a legitimate case to potentially start next year. I understand Cameron Kelly is going to be back there as well. He showed some good things, especially in the game against Clemson. But Don Chapman has a legitimate chance to start next year. He is a really good football player. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to take a guy off the field where every time he's on the on the field, he's forcing turnovers, he's making plays, he's tackling well in space. I mean, and that, that's, that's what you're wanting out of your guy and the kind of what, what Jay Bateman wants out of the guys in the secondary. So he's got a year in the system. He understands the scheme. I mean, it's just going to be really hard to not put that guy on the field. But, I mean, if not, I mean, at least you know you have a guy, if someone gets hurt, that he's more than capable than coming in and making right. plays or when they rotate. and You know, I, I, that's the thing we talked about when all the injuries started happening in that back, in that back four was, yeah, where they're building depth for next year. 
and that's something that is scary because Carolina is they they they've got to get deeper defensively, and you've you've already gotten deeper going into 2020 with all the injuries you suffered, getting all these young guys meaningful reps. You're adding a lot of talent coming back into next year. Probably going to be the strength of your football team when you open up at Central Florida, and that's that's something we haven't seen. We talk about the Butch Dara Davis a lot. That Butch era, or the Butch Davis era secondaries were legitimate, like NFL quality units, and Carolina's getting back to that. When they took the field, or when they were supposed to take the field in the opener against LSU, I think everybody that started in that sec that was supposed to start in that secondary went on to the NFL. So basically everybody in the 09 secondary went on to play at least one year in the NFL. And that's kind of the point where you're going to get to at Carolina because, I mean, it, it, just looking at some of the guys, you feel like already, okay, these guys are showing signs that they're only going to grow. I mean, some of these guys came in as mid-level four stars or mid-level, four, excuse me, mid-level three stars and are already making big impacts as true freshmen. So, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how they progress along. Um, I mean, just some other guys uh, that had good days. I mean, Timon Fox, that's the best performance that we've seen from him in a while. Uh, so very encouraging for him out there. Um, Chaz Surratt, again, another great day. Uh, I mean, at this point, I, I saw Mark Armstrong uh, of ABC 11 tweet out that he thinks Surratt is gone, no chance he's coming back. I mean... Yeah. I don't know about that. No, Surratt but... has to come back because you've got one year of film on you. That's it. Right. I mean, and, it'll be it'll be look, interesting because he's ranked pretty high already on some of the boards and everything like that. But, I mean, if he comes back. It'd be different if he was a quarterback and did all this in one year. You know what I'm saying? Like, when, when Cam Newton burst on the scene at Auburn. A, a quarterback that came in and in one year just sailed up draft boards to get picked in the first round. I wonder who that could be. Uh, we haven't had one of those in our program's history. So, I mean, it's just, look, he, he, selfish Tar Heel fan, yeah, I, we, I want you back to put you in the defense in the second year. But realistically, like, I mean, yeah, you're high on draft boards, but a lot of that is with you developing a, a lot of upside. Right. Why not come back and put it on another tape of film for a second year? Right. And, and you – because, I mean, he did have some issues sometimes tackling, but that was expected because he was converting from quarterback to linebacker. Yeah, I mean, he got you know? a lot more consistent as the year so, went along. I, would, I mean, come back, you clean up your game, you're going to be the quarterback of the defense, you're going to be the most talked about player defensively on this football team, no question. And let's say you lead a defense that guides Carolina to the Coastal title, you play for an ACC championship, playing in those kind of games are only going to help your draft stock. Play in the Senior Bowl, too, yeah. chance. I mean, he looks like a guy that, I mean, look, if he was a senior this year, he'd be a shoe in to be in the Senior oh, Bowl. Oh, yeah, they no doubt. Him. So, I think, yeah, that's, because when he goes through the draft process, do you not feel like he's going to get criticized for his size, uh, only little, playing the one year? Every you little thing that they, that they can critique about him right. will be critiqued because you have one year of film defensively at the collegiate level. They don't care what you did in high school. What right. they care about is what right. you did. Right, and he didn't play linebacker in high so, school either. So, yeah, that's that's the problem. Uh, and, you know, look, I don't think he would make the comment and, and tell Mac Brown, hey, I'm coming back, and then change his mind. I mean, look, he's a college kid, and, look, we're not going to bust his okay. ass if he does. Well, to be fair, but we, Mac said he expects everyone back. He also said that he expected all 25 guys to sign in the early signing period, and there was a time during the day where it looked like Clyde Pinder wouldn't sign that so again, you can't a hundred percent go off of that. It's a really good sign that he says he expects everybody back, but at the same time, it's never a hundred percent with these guys. Um, now, Michael Carter said after the game he's coming back, so there's no worry there. Daz knew some. Somebody asked me about him possibly going to the draft. It's like I told them, he is a good enough player to get drafted. I don't think he would get drafted in this wide receiver class. This is the most loaded wide receiver class that I have ever seen in terms of the NFL draft. The amount of guys, if you just go through and look at each and every name, you would say, okay, I could see that guy getting drafted. I mean, I, I don't, I've gone through plenty of draft boards already, and he's not even on the list. And we're talking about some draft boards that are listing 50. 55 guys, and he's not even on the list. So to me, if you're Daz Newsome, you're going to look at what happened with Anthony Ratliff-Williams last year, a guy that 
let's be honest, he, he could he could play in the NFL. He's got the, he's got legit attributes. He can get open. He does a good job going up and getting the football. There were some things there that made him intriguing. If you're Daz Newsome, why not come back, play in an offense that's going to be one of the ones that is going to be talked about throughout the nation next season and continue to build on your draft stock? I think that'll be pretty interesting uh, to talk about in the offseason. Uh, of course, we'll talk about some of the concerns as we start going through the offseason. Uh, really, I mean... The biggest concerns probably lie in the trenches. Replacing Charlie Heck, and then on the defensive side, you got to replace both Strobridge and Crawford. That'll be more the bigger concern is the defensive line. How do you get some of these young, talented players in the recruiting class to come in and mix with some of these guys that are inexperienced, but you know, still have enough experience to where they're probably going to come in with some edges. It'll be interesting to watch that area. That'll be the the best battles, really, of the entire spring. I uh, was watching some of the young guys come in, and then definitely in the fall when you start to get a guy like Desmond Evans coming in at that time, uh, as well as the secondary. So it's a ton of interesting stuff going on. Um, the expectations for this team, we said it after the game today, they are going to be... Uh, this is probably going to be the, uh, the the most pressure that this team has been under since 2010, right? Like, the expectations are going to be through the roof, especially when you look at the schedule. After they get past the first two games of the year, you have a very manageable schedule. It is not like this year where you're going to... I mean, you're, you look at the schedule and you say, wow, man, that's going to be unbelievably tough, a brutal stretch. You don't have to play Clemson next year. You don't see Wake Forest next year, a team that, you know, let's be honest. I know there were a lot of people saying today after they lost the bowl game, oh, yeah, see, this team's a fraud. Well, if they had Sage Sherratt and they had a couple of the other guys that went down with injuries, they would not have finished 8-5. and five. They would have been better than that. So I think Carolina, it's, it's setting up to where they can be really successful. And uh, I don't know about you. I am looking forward to magazine and speculation season for these for these Tar Heels because they are going to be one of the most talked about teams in the offseason when it comes to the teams that are on the rise and those teams that people are going to want to get behind this next coming season. Yeah, and I mean, look, for all the talk about expectation and all that, that comes when you bring in a Hall of Fame head coach. And this is what we wanted. Um, it was part of the the whole. I always I always say big boy football is well. That's what it is, right? You've got you got year one, um, year two, and look, you won. And seven and six isn't great, but that's more than what you've won the last two years. And like you said, you find a way to get through those first two games. The schedule sets up very favorably for you um, to make some noise, both in the ACC and nationally. And I think for Tar Heel fans that live Mac Brown Part 1, this is what they've been dying for, for you and I. This is what we got a taste of that in 2015. And I think it was a, I think it was a, a, a false taste. Uh, there wasn't really – that that I would felt like – I think they really overachieved in uh, overachieved in Overachieved? 15. There you go. But the difference – okay, so I was thinking about that too, and, and this will be the last thing that will kind of – debate here. You cut me off we... mid-thought, by the there way. There we go. That's what I do on the podcast because I own the podcast. So there you go. You do that all the time. You can do that on the uh, There's on no, the Roy's there's no ego in this room, is there? Because I Oh, mean... it's uh it's it's huge between me and you apparently. That's uh that's what that's what we tell each other all the time. So but uh see now I lost my train of thought because you're just over here going off the rails here. No, I you legitimately cut me off mid thought so I'll pick up where I was. We got a taste of College football playoff talk in 2015. There we go. And I, I made the comment after the hire that I think Mac Brown will get this program in that discussion, not fringed in the back 20s, that when a, when a ranking gets released in that first no, uh, week in November, Carolina is going to be in the top 10, top 12 kind of range. I think I think that's where this program can get to. You think that's next year? I don't. I don't know if it's next year. But I'm just thinking, you know, when everyone – people that lived in Mac Brown when he was here in the 90s, they were that close to winning a national championship. And that's what they've longed for. We got a taste of being in that kind of moment in 2015. And ever since, I've, I mean, I, I want that feeling again. And for the right. first time since that year, every Saturday this week, although this team wasn't competing for an ACC title, footballs or football Saturdays mattered not to me because, you know, there was a big matchup in the SEC – 
is because Carolina's got a pretty big ball game, and I, I, I missed that feeling. And it was a lot of fun going into Keenan Stadium and, and having something to cheer loud about instead of yelling about how bad the team was or how bad the coaching was. And so it's just it's just a whole a different feeling this time than than we've ever felt in, in in terms of our fandom of Carolina football. And I'm I'm excited for 2020. Well, I mean I mean that's that's how I put it. I'm ready to go. 20, so 2020, the 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 excitement around the season has to be the most excitement around a season probably since Mac Brown left, right? Maybe maybe 2010 might come close, but like I was thinking about that. I know 16, there was a lot. There were a lot of expectations. I mean, we, we really thought that Trubisky was, was going to be the guy, and he was. He was. We, they were, we were right about that. Um, he came in, pretty much settled that quarterback battle really early. But this year, doesn't it feel even different than that? Because Howell is there, established. You only feel like he's going to get better. The offensive weapons around him are better than what Trubisky had that year. Uh, mainly just because the running game you feel like is is in a little bit of better shape, uh, and then I mean you talk about really the biggest thing is the fact that you you appear to have a defense for the first time since Butch Davis left campus. I mean this has to be th- this is definitely more a, a more hyped season coming up than sixteen, right? Oh yeah, definitely. And you 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 got two marquee games to start the year. You're at Central Florida. Which won't be easy because remember Mackenzie Milton is coming back too. So I'm gonna need you to quit interrupting me. Okay. Well, I need to get a point in. So and there so you, go. you got at Central Florida, uh, and then you got Auburn in, in in the Georgia Dome week too. So you're gonna be in two marquee games to start the year. Good chance for Sam Howell to start his Heisman campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that I think you'll probably see the Carolina football the Twitter account kind of push in the offseason that this guy needs to be in Heisman talks. Cause he or had the a, Heel Tough blog. Uh, or the Heel Tough account will be pushing that, yes. He did have a, a record-setting season, not not just Carolina-wise, ACC-wise, nationally for a true freshman quarterback at the collegiate level. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of was undersold because of the team's record. But, I mean, yeah. You find a way to win those two games, and you've got Mac Brown, who knows how to sell a program better than just about any coach in college football. There's going to be a lot of talk. We've seen Kirk Herbstreit talk a lot of positively about this football program. You've seen David Pollock, Desmond Howard, all the guys on game day have raved about what Mac Brown's done, and all the every time ESPN's called a game. Well, you know what he means to them, and what he's meaning to Carolina football. So. And they've won seven games. It's yeah. not like they came I mean, out we, of one ten. So I mean, that's yeah, what's so. Gr- that's what's really good is that this is happening before it really even starts. Okay, well we're we're gonna cut off the twenty twenty talk because we're gonna be doing a ton of that in the off season. We got a long way to go. Believe I've got twenty twenty vision August. for twenty twenty. Oh my god! And he is muted for the rest of the podcast. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna wrap it up anyways. Um, so we're gonna be back sometime, probably after we get back. We, we got to go down for a trip to Florida. Um, so what we're gonna do is before we go. We will do an all-decade edition of the podcast. Um, we'll we'll just kind of break down uh, what's you know our, our teams for for the all-decade. Kind of debate that a little bit. Uh, that's something that's been going around. Uh, I'm got an article that I'm working on right now. So we'll have that conversation, and then that'll be it for 2020. Uh, or 2019, excuse me. Then we'll move over into the uh, year of 2020. When we come back, uh, we got a business trip that we have to go on for our job. And then when we come back, that's when we'll do uh, the player grades. We'll go back and look at who we had as some of our uh, our standouts and breakout stars and kind of look back on that. Uh, brag a little bit about how we were right about Deami Brown and then look at some of the other guys that we were just not even remotely close on uh, and kind of laugh about that a little bit. But we'll have that edition for you uh, probably sometime uh, in that first week of January, uh, maybe that weekend or uh, early on in the uh, sec- in the first full week of January. Uh, we'll have you covered with that. And then, of course, we'll go into full off-season mode. Uh, you know, we will not be having a podcast every single week when we get into off-season mode because, frankly, there just really won't be that many discussion uh, topics as we go throughout the uh, off-season. Um, we might have some some talk about the draft and everything, about guys that potentially declare uh, or if they decide to stay. We'll probably have an addition on the podcast about that. Um, and then also, you know, once we get towards February, normally we'd be talking about the signing
signing period and everything that's going on on the recruiting trail. Uh, really, I expect it'll probably be pretty quiet just from looking at you know what the Tar Heels have already done in the 2020 class and the fact that they really don't have a ton of other feelers out there just yet, haven't really been adding any offers uh, on the table just at the moment, but uh, if they do end up going there, uh, we got an article online that you guys can take a look at that could tell you where they might go in the 2020 class, and then also uh, some of the guys that will target for the 2021 class. Uh, I am going to do an addition of the podcast uh, with Zach coming up uh, sometime here in the future. It won't be too far down the line uh, where we will talk about uh, some of our guys from the 2021 class, guys that we think the Tar Heels should really be focused on, our favorite targets in the 2021 class. So that'll be a fun addition of the podcast, but uh, that's still a little bit down the line, probably sometime in about mid-January. We'll get that out to you guys. Uh, until then, you can, of course, keep up with everything that's going on uh, on the Heel Tough blog website. While the podcast might not be as often, uh, the Heel Tough blog uh, will never stop writing about Tar Heel football. There will always be some sort of storylines that we'll be able to write about. So while we go into off-season mode, meaning there won't, of course, be any recaps, stock reports, or trench reports, we will have the weekly storylines for you guys to kind of keep you up to date with everything around Tar Heel football. And we'll be writing articles about all sorts of stuff. I'll give you a look at maybe where some of the guys are projected to go uh, if they were to come out. Uh, in the draft, uh, some of the underclassmen we'll take a look at, see if maybe whether or not they should go. And then once we get into draft season, then we'll start breaking down where some of the experts have all of our guys going. So guys like Aaron Crawford, guys like Jason Strobridge, uh, who are looking to make it to the NFL, Charlie Heck, all those guys will probably be on NFL radars. So we'll have you covered with that as well as some, uh, you know, we'll have the recruiting stuff for you guys. Keep an eye on the 21 class and everything, right? Any commitment articles that we have. So uh, even though we are going into offseason mode, it doesn't mean uh, that the blog will be shut down. The other good thing is, unlike in the past few years, we do have basketball on the website. So look, the website, even though the football season is over, it's still going to be extremely active. And the basketball team right now, although they're on a little bit of a brief hiatus they had they come off a big win against UCLA now up to 7 and 5 on the season. I know that's not really a thrilling record, but there's a chance where, you know, if they play the way that they played against UCLA, they could get this season turned back in a really good direction and have themselves in contention for when, you know, potentially Cole Anthony returns mid-January to be in the thick of things in the ACC. We'll have you covered with all of that on the Heel Tough blog and the Roy's Boys podcast. Make sure you guys go over to the Roy's Boys podcast tab on the website right next to the Heel Tough blog podcast tab and check it out. We got a new logo and everything, so uh, it's really Really exciting time uh, for the Roy's Boys podcast as well. Uh, it's going to simmer down a little bit for the Heel Tough blog podcast, but uh, Roy's Boys podcast will probably pick up. So make sure you guys uh, keep an eye on that and uh, keep an eye on the website. Uh, we want to encourage you guys, of course, to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast and the Roy's Boys podcast. You can do that on any of your major sites. Uh, iTunes podcast, uh, Google podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, all those different sites. You can go on there, uh, subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode, and just leave us a, a rating and a review. We'd really appreciate that. So I uh, want to thank you guys for listening to this edition of the Heel Tough Vlog podcast, the final season edition of the Heel Tough Vlog podcast. Of course, we'll be back with previews and recaps next year, but plenty more to do uh, as we head into the offseason. So once again, thank you guys for listening, and as always, go Tar Heels!